Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I am so happy you've decided to join me here today. And I love what I'm talking about today, y'all. So this episode I named Black-Eyed Susans, not the Ditch Dwellers. Um, Black-Eyed Susans, which are, um, that's the common name, the botanical name of this family is Rudbeckia. And it is a really important family for me. And I just wanted to share about it. In fact, I did a social media post about it today. And I just didn't have enough room to write all the things that I wanted to say about this family. And so I thought, what an amazing podcast topic, right? So what we're going to talk about today, Rudbeckia's is a huge family of a bunch of different varieties um, and strands of that family. And we're talking about um, the Rudbeckia herda. That is the annual reseeding, hardy annual um, arm of this family. And we're going to talk about varieties and stuff, but it is a very confusing family to folks because there are some in here in the Rudbeckia family that are perennials, um, some that are biennials, which means they um, have a longer period, they need a cold period. But what we are talking about is the Rudbeckia herdas, and that's what I primarily grow in my cutting garden because they are abundant. Um, They just pump out the stem. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on through this discussion. But I am super excited. The reason I say these are not the ditch dwellers, um, Rudbeckia's um, herdas are native um, for us here. And so what that means is that there are some that you see growing um, out in the wild and oftentimes here where I am in the mid-Atlantic, you know, you're driving down the interstate and you'll see some popping up in the ditch areas or on the side of the road. And those are amazing, but those are not, I'm talking about varieties um, that have um, become just super great cut flowers because of the size of the bloom, the different colors and variations. And so Because I'm often, um, when I talk to people back when, you know, we were doing like live events, right? I would talk about them and people are like, oh gosh, you mean I've seen them grown on the side of the road. There's nothing spectacular about them. Well, y'all, there is so much more to that. So let me introduce you to the rest of the story on Rudbeckia. Um, So... First, let's just talk about one of the things that drew me to them um, out of the gate. So the very first ones that I met was the Rudbeckia Indian Summer. Indian Summer um, was actually a part of that very first cutting garden that I grew back in 1998 that I learned that I could fall plant, you know, I mean, rabbit hole already. When I read the book, The Flower Farmer, it was in the middle of summer, and then I was all pumped to do something, but it was the end of summer, and I'm like, what can I do now? Well, I found that Indian summer, uh, Rudbeckia is is one of those winter hardy, cool season hardy annuals, and so I planted Indian summer, and I believe that my amazing experience with how easy they were And the abundance is what helped me go down that road. So they're easy to start from seed. Even though they are a kind of slow growers, um, most of the Rudbeckia, the the herdas anyway, are really um, fairly easy to start from seed. So that just makes more reasons for you to love them, right? And because they are a bit of slow growers, I've often mentioned that um, because we do fall plant them, they are the first seed we start in the very late summer because they do tend to grow slow. 
Um, I also, this led me to, in fact, always transplant them. We do not direct seed them out in the garden, and that's a primary reason. Anything that's slow to germinate out in the garden is a challenge because, you know, weed pressure just overtakes them unless you are um, really on top of keeping them weeded while they go through their 30 days of, you know, growing into a baby little teeny plant. And most of us just don't do that. That is the reality, right? So while they can be direct seeded, and that is obvious because many of them are strong reseeders, um, in, in fact, in generally, I transplant in the beginning all of my Rudbeckia plantings in my working cutting garden. Um, you can't, as a for a working cutting garden, meaning you're doing a cutting garden with a purpose, whether you're a flower farmer or you're growing for a project that you're doing, you don't want to rely on reseeding um, for your production. So we start them as transplants, and when you transplant them out, they really need little care after that. If you plant them in their spot, they need full blasting sun. Um, and that means at least eight hours of sunlight a day. And after that, I mean, we don't really do any fertilizing out in the garden. I mean, they don't need foliar feeding. I don't think it'll hurt them, but we don't do it. And they really aren't very choosy about the soil you plant them in. You can plant them into fairly kind of, we'll call it crummy soil, soil that an area of your garden that, you know, you're working on that still isn't up to where you think it needs to be. Rudbeckias can definitely be a candidate there. They do enjoy um, soil that's not overly fertile, but is fertile and has a good organic matter content because the moisture retention helps them. Um, and I do net black-eyed Susans, all of them, because, oh my goodness, once they start budding up and opening, the canopy gets really heavy and all it takes is one spring or summer thunderstorm to put them all in the dirt. And so we find that um, they benefit. And whenever I don't net them, which, you know, sometimes that happens, we lose a lot of beautiful stems um, to going down in the mud. Now, in our native areas where um, we have native islands, I call them here on my farm, um, where they reseed and those are not netted. Those, you know, we take what we can get and those are not used primarily as cutting. But in the cutting garden, I definitely net it. You know, the amazing abundance of this family is just one of the reasons that I have grown to love them so much. Um, I will, I will um, feel pretty assured in saying that you will never be able to cut all of them. You might be able to cut all of them, but I don't know that you would ever be able to use all of them if you plant in any kind of volume. I love the story that Dave Dowling tells um, in one of our many chats that we've had um, about growing, you know, Rudbeckias. And they, back in his heyday when they were growing, he was growing, um, in production on his farm, and they were going to multiple farmer's markets. Oftentimes, when they would all go off to market on Saturdays, there would be people at home on the farm working, including cutting flowers, because he did a big Sunday market also. And there was a new employee um, that had been assigned to cut the Rudbeckia, and because they had been trained, as is true in, you know, 95% of all of our crops, you're, you're trained to cut every stem that is open, right? Well, that cannot really be true in Rudbeckia because when it is in high season of Rudbeckia, there are so many stems that are open. I mean, one plant will have 25 stems on it. Well, they left this poor person on the farm to harvest the Rudbeckia. And when they got back from um, the market, 
there was like, I don't remember how many buckets he said, but it was like that person's, you know, weary <laughs> look on their face and all of these buttons, buckets of Rebecca had been cut. Um, so I'm here to say that the abundance of Rebecca can do you in. Um, I'm not saying to not plan a lot. I'm saying plan on not cutting it all. Um, and that's why it pays um it plays such an important role in our, on our farm as an attractor for pollinators, native bees, butterflies, and birds, because there's always some flowers left in the garden. It is a super long-lasting cut flower. Most of them are. Um, another great story, um, Dr. Dole, John Dole from NC State, who does so much um cut flower crop research, including post-harvest handling. Um, Indian summer, um, which is just one of the many varieties um, that I am going to um, tell you when I share the ones, the ones that I grow. Um, Indian summer is known to, on occasion, not real often, but on occasion, Indian summer will last 12 to 20 days in a vase or two days in a vase. Um, they John did a study at NC State trying to figure out what creates this phenomena where you'll go along and you're getting these amazing vase lives, then all of a sudden you'll have this pop of time where, you know, two days after they're cut, they just wilt in the vase. And the um, results of his trial were they could not figure out what causes that. It's just a phenomena that happens from time to time. In my experience, it's only been an Indian summer, and it doesn't really happen that often. But just for you to know that it could happen, um, that way if you get a call back from a commercial customers, commercial customers love Rebecca's, if they call back and say, oh my gosh, that Rudbeckia you brought me was like dead the next morning in the cooler, then you know why. It's like, oh my gosh, that phenomena happens, it occurs, just replace their flowers or give them a credit and go on. I mean, there's just, there's nothing to be done about it. But overall, um, Rudbeckia herdas have amazing vase lives. Um, so another thing that really was of surprise to me is this is the family of flowers that really introduced me to this group of native bees. You know, I, like so much of the world, always thought of honeybees. Um, when you hear somebody talk about bees, honeybees, in fact, aren't even native, y'all. They came from Europe. And they typically live in, I mean, we have to provide them with housing in, in boxes, right? Um, the hives that we see. There is native bees um, outside of everybody's back door. And Rudbeckias is a very important family of flowers for them. And I believe that the reason that we have such an amazing community of native bees on my farm is because I out of the gate started growing lots of Rudbeckias, right? And so I was fascinated with all of this. Um, I mean, you can go down a deep hole, um, a rabbit hole that has no bottom, when you start looking up and learning about the native bees that you will find on your Rudbeckias. So Rudbeckias are a big part of us providing um, for the environment here on our farm. So in addition to an amazing cut flower, um, I mean, of course, loaded with butterflies, and then um, the, the crew that comes in at the end of a Rudbeckia flower stem's life are the birds that eat the seeds that they produce, the gold finches um, that just come in and are just such a delight to watch in the garden, right? Um, the pest 
issues with rudbeckias that I have personally experienced in general. I would have said a year ago that the deer just don't touch them, but that's not true now. I have a cutting garden up at my church's child care center at the end of my street, um, a big cutting garden project we worked on, and the deer ate them up there. They have never touched them on my farm, so can't say that anymore. Um, some of the Rubeckias will get an outbreak of aphids, but it's usually in small pockets. And guess what? Um, our beneficial insects, you know, the ladybugs um, and even the birds are just waiting to chow down on them amongst other beneficial insects. Um, and you can really read more about that in my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, which is about a three season cutting garden, y'all. One of my favorite images is there in the book showing a goldfinch on Rudbeckia, which is what most people associate with this family of seed eaters. Um, but there are so many other creatures that eat soft-bodied um, insects in our garden, and Rudbeckias do a great job of bringing them in. When we plant out our transplants um, in the fall over winter, we can have a little slug damage on our rudbeckias. Um, they, the slugs tend to really um, like rudbeckias because rudbeckia foliage kind of grows low to the ground. Um, but I have found that once we the spring starts and the birds come back to the garden in high activity and they have, you know, they're they're pregnant and they're getting ready to have babies and. Um, they're going to ramp up their intake of insects. The birds clean our beds of slugs, and that rudbeckia quickly regrows from, from where those damaged leaves are. You know, goldfinches are probably an earmark of what people think of when they think of black-eyed Susans. And I just want to say that that is the tip of the iceberg, y'all. There are so many great things that this wonderful family of flowers um, brings to your garden. And also, which, you know, some people consider it a gift. Other people are not so happy. Um, many of the Rudbeckias, but not all of them, are strong reseeders in your garden. And particularly if you're a home gardener or you're trying to start an beneficial islands like I have in my on my farm, um, that's a great gift of... Um, this family of flowers, is that they will reseed where you plant them, um, which gives you the option to take them out as a weed or to leave them and let them grow with little um, work from you. You know, so those are all great reasons to love this family. Um, but for me, as a flower farmer, Rudbeckias became a major cash crop. Their use in our bouquets, um, was priceless, but also our commercial customers absolutely adored them. You know, that Colonial Williamsburg was a major customer for us for over um, 15 years, and their love of Rudbeckias, of course, because they're natives, um, in addition, you know, that just played into their story so much. And other commercial customers, frankly, y'all, they didn't even know that what I was bringing them, you know, when they first saw them on my availability list, and I didn't send images with my availability list um, back then, and they would say, Black Eyed Susans, eh, I don't know. All it would take is one sample of the that particular Black Eyed Susan um, to woo them in. They had no idea what I was selling. And, you know, I want to say that is so often the case in the flowers that we are growing as commercial growers. Your commercial customers are not familiar with them. Oftentimes they poo poo them because they have an image in their mind that is totally incorrect. That's why I am such a um, fan of giving abundant free samples every time a new crop comes in because your customers just don't even know what it is. So their contribution as a cash crop are huge. Um, another thing that I really love about Rudbeckias is they are a super winter hardy 
cold, cool season hardy annual. They are in fact hardy to zone five. So that means that if you live in winter hardiness zone five, six, seven, eight, and nine, you definitely need to jump on the fall planting bandwagon because of all of the perks. You will get more abundance, meaning more stems. You'll get taller stems and you'll get earlier blooms. Um, in fact, I think that that is, um, that can be a problem with some of the Rudbeckias, especially those dark colored ones. I mean, they, those dark colored Rudbeckias just aren't really useful in my book in early spring and in summer. People just aren't ready for that. Um, so you have to find a way to manipulate those later in the season, perhaps. Um, and so there's great abundance. Now, the second normal planting window of cool flowers is what I refer to as very early spring. That is the six to eight weeks before your last spring frost to have your transplants ready to go in the ground. My experience here in the mid-Atlantic with a mid-April last spring frost, which would mean mid-February, very early spring planting, those that planting kind of almost bloomed at the same time as my fall planting. So what I experimented with is actually planting some of the Rudbeckias, primarily those um, that produce the tallest stems, to plant them a little bit later in spring. And the reason I'm referencing tall spring, um, tall stemmed varieties is because one of the problems with planting later in spring than the very early spring or fall is that the stems won't be quite as tall. So to do a real experiment of those darker colored ones, planting more like in spring and seeing if you can get them to bloom later into fall, late summer with a stem that's actually usable is the challenge, but I think it's definitely a challenge worth experimenting. Um, so to speak to what I grow um, of the Rudbeckia hurtas, so I grow on a regular basis, the Indian summer, prairie sun, which is, prairie sun is the green eye. That is my all time go-to favorite. I love it because of that green eye. It makes it so versatile and so colorful. It's useful everywhere. Um, Goldilocks, double daisy. Um, it is not a herda, but Rudbeckia triloba. Um, I want to just say I do grow that, but it is not a herda and does not fall into, I grow it in a different way than I do the herdas. Um, and so this year, so those are my four go-to Rudbeckias that I have been growing um, for several years. This year we have added, or this season, we're anxious to find out from the fall planting um, what Sahara, Cherokee, Sunset, um, Sorry, on my mind has just gone blank. Cherokee Sunset, oh, Denver Daisy, and Cherry Brandy. Um, those are all four that I have not grown in many years that were regrowing. The others that I love, but I don't grow them as a cash crop because they're more perennial and they just don't produce enough to work is I absolutely adore Rudbeckia maxima. Um, you have to look that up. The cone, the flower is huge. The cone of that flower is like as big as your thumb. It looks like a sombrero um, hat and totally love it. And it would be totally cool in a um, bouquet, but they just don't produce enough. Um, so that was just an honorable mention. Um, so those are the hurdas that I have that are a go-to in my garden um, and those that I am experimenting with um, this season. So I already spoke to you about the dark flowers. Um, and so friends, this just is such a great family of flowers. It is not hard to love them. I love what they offer as cuts 
I love the butterflies. I love the bees. I love the birds. I just love all of the creation that kind of comes in and interacts with them um, while I am there working on them, you know? Um, And so in my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, um, Vegetables Love Flowers is broken into four sections. One of the sections, which I believe it's the last section in the book, is titled Heroes of the Garden. And that section is opened with a full page image of Rudbeckia with one of our goldfinches sitting on it. And I just love everything that image represents. Um, I think that that's kind of like the poster child of the Rudbeckia family. That's what people think of, just like how I talk about in the book that the poster child of beneficial insects is the ladybug. That's the what everybody automatically thinks of. But just like the finch is in the Rudbeckia family, as the ladybug is in the beneficial insects, that they are the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more to this family. And I talk a lot about that in Vegetables Love Flowers, about just when you walk through that doorway of growing some of these flowers as cuts on a farm, environment is how I found them. But when you include them in your cutting garden, it is y'all a door that you will never come back out of. Um, I just think that they were my awakening to the natural order of a garden when we just follow those steps of which I talk about in the book, not using any pesticides, organic or otherwise, y'all. Um, we just don't use any pesticides at all because we know it harms somebody somewhere in the chain of life. And that's what you can really learn about in addition to growing a cutting garden and vegetables love flowers. So friends, I just wanted to introduce you um, to the Black Eyed Susan, a.k.a. Rudbeckia, And it's not the ones growing in the ditch, which so many people associate with. So if you want to learn more, um, find the seeds and learn more about each one, visit thegardenersworkshop.com, which is my online garden shop and learning center. It's packed. Um, And you can connect with me weekly. I do several lives a week. You can find that connection on my website where I do Q&As, and I would love to connect with you there. And follow me on social media. I'm always featuring stuff. You can go to my Instagram feed and find where I wrote about, excuse me, this family of flowers and my love of it. Until friends, we meet again here on the Field and Garden Podcast. Ciao.